Welcome back, Shalligators. You know we don't have to talk about this. You know we have to talk about this. The Kardashians premiere on Hulu and the whole episode, I thought it was just gonna be like a little bit, the whole episode was Chloe dealing with the same fucking thing she's always dealing with. The same thing we've, we've been dealing with for what, four years? Five years? I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. Groupon penis fucking Tristan Thompson. <clears throat> if you don't know, Chloe recently welcomed a baby with Tristan Thompson via surrogate and they did the like embryo transfer like three days before she found out he'd knocked up someone else. And like, it was too late. Like the surrogate was already pregnant. And the whole thing, I mean, this whole thing is so fucking sci-fi, right? Like embryo transfers and a baby in someone else's belly. And it's just, what a time to be alive. What a time to decide when life is created, right? Isn't this some Jurassic Park shit? And listen, I'm gonna try not to make this video a whole rant about Jurassic Park line I always go back to in terms of these very cutting edge fertility things with you've been so concerned with whether or not you could, you never stop to think about if you should. I'm not gonna, to, I'm not gonna make a whole video about that. Just a very good portion of it. Okay, what are we gonna talk about in this? Well, of course, I'm going to drag Tristan for filth. I am not going to drag Chloe because truly this woman is suffering enough. Like this woman is suffering enough and so much of her pain is from people, I don't wanna say like me, because Chloe, you know I am on your team. Girl, I'm on your team, sweetheart. But the public opinion, so I'm definitely, I don't wanna pile on. I just, I would say I can't imagine going through something like this, but like I was crying within the first, I'm gonna cry in this video. This isn't even my circus. And here I am like ah, laughing at the clowns and crying <laughs> over what's going on. The core of what she's experiencing, betrayal, humiliation, regret with no course for reversal, right? Haven't we all dealt with that? No, maybe not in front of 125 million people. No, maybe not crying in the front seat of a Bentley. It was a Honda Civic. But these emotions are not foreign to us. And if anything, if we have learned anything this week between Adam Levine cheating on a motherfucking Victoria's Secret model and, you know, Chloe getting revisiting this whole thing, it's money, beauty, fame, fill in the blank. Any blank, you, any word you want to put in there does not insulate you from pain, from heartbreak. And the worst part is, it should. It should. Right? What the fuck? What are we chasing? What are we chasing money for if it's not going to make our life better, if it's not going to bring love into our life, if it's not going to guarantee us some kind of positive outcome? What? What on earth? So we just out, we're just out here raw dogging life, right? We're just out here like experiencing things with no guarantee. Yeah. So I'm going to talk, I think, because when I started this video, I, I don't always know where these videos are going to go. I, I rarely do. And I just kind of let them flow where they need to flow. Much like I live the rest of my life. <laughs> Is it a great idea? No. Um, I think we should talk about how to deal with regret. Like how to deal with a circumstance you you cannot change. And look, a lot of circumstances in life, you can. You can quit that job. You can drop out of law school. You can move cities. You can divorce that person. Some things you can't. Or maybe if you can change them, the cost of changing them is so great, it's like, it's not viable. Like, oh, I could drop out of school and my family would never speak to me again. Or I'd lose this job and I couldn't eat. I get it. Or maybe it's just not that even, maybe it's not even that big. Maybe it's looking back. Oh, I know why I'm gonna cry in this video. I know why I'm gonna cry in this video. Oh, okay. I, <laughs> I might as well just get it out of the way. Let's just get it out of the way. Let's get the tears out of the way. I always get really sad in the fall because I got married in the fall. <laughs> why am I crying about this? I'm on day two of my period. That could have something to do with it. I'm gonna cry at like a particularly moving like Lexus commercial. Anyway. I think that there's something in the, like truly when the air changes, like when the barometer pressure changes and the seasons change and we're going back to school or the summer's over and we're looking at the holidays maybe or the next year barreling down on us. Like 
it is natural for us to stop and reflect. And you know, one thing I've realized, reflection doesn't always yield a lot of positive thoughts. Reflection most of the time can be really painful. And that pain can stem from regret of knowing that like something is gone. What is happening right now? Am I okay? Sorry, you guys. I didn't even bring Kleenex. Why would I be crying about Tristan Thompson? My God, all right. I hope he has a small, soft wiener, but you know he doesn't. You know it's enormous. Look. Anyway, I think it's very typical for all of us right now. I take Cowboy to daycare, my dog, and I was I picked him up and there was like, rah, 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 like all the dogs were barking. I was like, good God, have they been like this all day? And she's like, yeah, it's this time of season. And for like two weeks, they are just going bananas. It's like something in the air, like they feel it, they sense it, they don't like it for whatever reason. They are not some pumpkin spice basic bitches. They're just like, I have all the feelings. And I'm like, you know what? If a dog can feel those things with their like sort of limited capacity, maybe we all are too. Like maybe there is something in the air that we're just like feeling a lot of things. Or maybe it's day two of my period and I'm just dragging you guys down with me, welcome. But let's talk about how to deal with regrets and things you don't know how to change. But before we get started, <laughs> I have the hiccups now. Now I have, hicc I have like the cry hiccups. Let's talk about how we can change things. You guys have heard me talk about Laura St. John. She's my mindset coach. She's a celebrity manifestation coach. You might've seen her on um, the last season of Selling Sunset. She works with athletes, billionaires, children. She even works with homeless people. Like she works with everybody. So many of us are focused on, we're focused but we're focused on the wrong thing. And we're confident, but we're confident that something bad is going to happen. So I have been working with her for a long time and she has changed my life more with like one solo session than truly a year of therapy, truly. It's incredible. So she does these online courses. I'm part of uh, this new series. It started, it started Thursday, but you have a week to enroll and then enrollment is closed. If this is kicking something up, there's a reason. You might just be ready for the change. You might be ready for the shift. And listen, we're not always ready. I get it. But if you are, this is the sign to go forward. And she also has super affordable, like little $20 downloadables. She's also on TikTok. So her content is super accessible. But if you want to sign up for the group course, go ahead and click the link down in the bio. And there's a code love shall and you can save 20%. Okay, less awesome. <sighs> Chloe. I feel like in every one of these videos, I say the same thing. What do we say at this point? What do we say? What is there left to say? What is there left to feel? What is there left to like wag your finger? I mean, of course, of course we could sit here and point out why this wasn't a good idea. And let me, t let me get my Jurassic Park fertility rants out of the way. Nothing makes me crazier than people who talk about God's plan, it's God's plan. And they're going through these insane, over the top machinations to have a baby that are actually clearly in contrary to God's plan. If Chloe couldn't get pregnant with this man, maybe this was the hand of God pushing something out of the way. And you're like, no, 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 I, I decide, I decide. God's plan is fine as long as it lines up exactly with my plan. God's plan is the phrase I'm gonna use when I made a mistake, but I won't take any responsibility for it. Oh, no, 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 this is God's plan. No, God already made the plan. Mother nature made that plan and they didn't select you to have a baby with this person. Not because you're a bad person, not even because maybe you don't love them. Maybe there's something down the line that you can't see, whether it's, oh, he sticks his dick into literally anything outside of a light socket. And I'm sure he's even tried that, if they're wide enough. The ones in like Poland, they're a little wider. He might've tried that one. Maybe it's a peanut allergy. Maybe it's autism. We don't know. We don't know. God and mother nature might, we don't. And yet we're the ones pulling the strings and then pushing it all back on God and the universe for the outcome. I, it just, and you know what? You could say the exact same thing about abortion. You absolutely could. You absolutely could. It's like, well, it was God's plan for you to have a baby. I totally, I know that. I absolutely know that. And did I decide that no, like my plan was going to supersede mother nature's plan? Yeah, I did. I've terminated a pregnancy. I don't regret it. But look, I might regret it one day. 
I, you know, I might be 55 and be like, great fucking job. I might. And I have, you know, speaking of surrogacy, like when Max and I were together, speaking of Tristan fucking Thompson, when Max and I were together and we were talking about the future and he's like, you know, we, I would love to have a baby. You know I mean? We were, we we're talking about it in kind of like vague terms, but I'm like, listen, if we would ever have a baby, we're getting a surrogate. I don't want to be pregnant. I fucking hated it. I hated it. I don't want to, I, I just, I don't want to be pregnant, you know? And I felt like a huge hypocrite in that moment because mostly overall I am. Aren't we, aren't we all, aren't we all? Like we can all walk it like we talk it when like it's not actually in our face. Like, oh no, I wouldn't get a surrogate. I don't even have a boyfriend. Like, yeah, no, no shit. Like, oh wow, what an easy choice to make, you know? I'd never rob a bank. Like no one's asking. It's like when you sign the dare pledge when you're 12. No one's offering me drugs. Like, well, I will never say, I, I'll never say yes. And the drug dealers are like, I don't want you to have my, no, I'm not asking, I'm not offering them to you. We're good. Anyway, you know, now it's like, listen, I know that if I would have a baby probably going forward in my life, like I'm what, a thousand years old. Even if I met someone tomorrow, I wouldn't want a baby right. I don't want a baby at all. I don't want a baby at all. But let's say my mind changes. By the time I did make that decision, I mean... Yeah, I would either need probably, maybe, I don't know, some fertility help, which doesn't sound fun, or just fuck it, like a surrogate. So, you know, I get why people do it. I get why people do it, for sure. I do not get why people do it with Tristan Thompson. That's what I don't get. That's the part that fucks me up, is that you go to these extreme lengths to have a baby with someone who is so incredibly toxic. And you knew it. That, that is what fucks us all up. Listen, like she didn't know this. I mean, yeah, have a baby via surrogate, like whatever. But you knew it, you knew it. It broke my heart in this show when she said, you know, cause remember when she had True and it had come out like a day before she went into labor that Tristan was cheating on her. He was at a club like finger blasting everybody caught standing still, you know, and she like let him come into the room and she was putting on a happy face and not addressing it. Turns out she had gone into labor weeks early because of the stress, weeks. The consequences that could have on a baby could last a lifetime. Their lungs aren't developed. You know, I mean, they could have a breast milk allergy. I'm not a doctor, but like, I know enough that like the baby will come out when it's cooked and not when its mother is so stressed. She's like pushing it out just via stress alone. So it's that that is what fucks us up about Chloe. It's like, how? Uh, you knew, you knew. And I know, again, I'm not here to pile on to her because God knows she suffered enough. But like, the, the reason it's fucking her up so bad is because she knew also. And we've said this here on the channel, we've said this, that when I get questions from you guys, it, ne it almost never comes down to, I didn't know who this person was. I had no idea. By the time you get to me, it comes down to, I did know. And <laughs> I made excuses for it. And I took him back anyway. And now I want revenge. And now I'm so bitter. And now I don't know what to do. Because I can't turn back time to the point where I should have left. I can't get that time back, that week, that month, that year, that decade. I can't get it back. How the fuck do I process this and move on? And the temptation, the impetus is to shift into hating the guy. Of course. I mean, he's the architect of your misfortune. Of course, right? I hate him. I want to destroy him. I want revenge. I can't move on. I, he's apologized even. Like, I can't move on. I have gotten my revenge. I can't move on. Like, it's, I've got a new relationship. I can't move on. I'm still so stuck in this bitterness. Why, why, why? What do I do? Listen, you know I'm the bitch that does evil week. And by the way, it's coming. I would love to know your evil week suggestions down below. Um, tell them to me. Tell them to me. This they're good. I'm excited for this year. But I definitely want to know what you guys want to see. Um, yeah, and we've covered a lot of topics now. I think this is the fourth year I've done fourth or fifth year I've done Eva Week, and I'm I'm okay with repeating things like how to cheat and get away with it because some things need updates, and sometimes I've learned a thing or two. <laughs> 
Anyway, I'm the woman that does Evil Week. And yeah, it's in the moment so satisfying to focus on like, how do I get revenge? How, how do I destroy this other person? Let me tell you something. It's never going to matter. You could literally shoot them dead. You could cut their nose off their face. Like you're a Medici family member kidnapping someone from the Pozzi family. I know too much about Italian history. But until you deal with it yourself, you're never going to move on. Because what you're stuck on isn't what they did. What you're stuck on is what you ignored. That's the root of the hurt. And that is the hardest thing in the world to look in the face. Because you already feel so bad. You already feel so betrayed and so sad and so you've lost this time and you're bitter. Like, oh, should I add one more layer onto this? That This is actually my fault. Oh, this is perfect. This is somehow going to lead to me feeling better. No, this is going to be the thing that just sends me over the edge. I don't have it in me to look at this. I can't do this. Do I have it in me to be mad at them and try to destroy them? <laughs> oh, you bet I do. I can't hate myself any more than I do. Hold on. That's not the point. That's not what we're going to do right now. It's not about hate. It's about understanding. I want you to get curious and not furious. This truly is one of the hardest things we can do in life is gain objectivity about our own behavior. It's very difficult. Why? Because we are compelled to put a story to our behavior all the time. We've talked before about pain versus suffering, right? Pain is... This man cheated on me. <laughs> That's pain, right? The betrayal, the hurt, the confusion. The suffering is the story we attach to that. He cheated on me because I'm a piece of shit. Because uh, that girl has bigger boobs and I don't. So why would any man ever stay faithful to a girl who's a B cup? He cheated on me because I am in a bad place in my life and I just let him be here, right? It's the story we attach. That's where the bitterness comes in and that's where the healing stops. That's where the closure hits a brick wall. So how do we dismantle this? Curious, not furious. If we can flex the muscle of gaining clarity about why we make the decisions we do from why did I need to order that queso to did I really need to add three more things into my Shein cart when I haven't paid my rent yet this month? What is compelling me? What is that psychological splinter inside? What is that emotional itch I'm trying to scratch? What is it? And how can I scratch this itch, pull out that splinter in a healthier way that is actually going to lead to healing instead of just more compounded hurt and misery? Do you know how many people in the world do this? Very few. Very, very, very few. So if you're here watching this video and if you're stuck around to this point, you are one of these few. You are the elite. You are the best of the best. You're the top gun of psychological warriors. You are. People don't want to know. They don't. Why? Because when you see, you have to believe. When you read writing on the wall, you're compelled to act. I have a friend right now. You guys heard me talk about her on the Shalantourage. If you're in the Shalantourage, I, I did a video about like... She came to my homecoming party that I had recently and was an absolute war machine. Like she was picking fights with everyone. She was purposely doing things to try to piss me off, like copy my outfit. It was just, she was cruising for a bruising, right? And that's because she's in a very, very bad relationship. Very bad. And so she, and I can like break someone's behavior down because this is what I do for a living. <laughs> she is looking for engagement. And she would love positive engagement, but that's, that's long ago and far away. She is, she is past that point. Positive engagement is no longer doing it for her in terms of filling that cup of attention, right? So she wants negative engagement. Fine. I'm going to pick a bunch of fights. And then, then I get to feel, she, you know, she picks a fight with someone and she's like, I get to feel like a victim because now this person's mad at me and I didn't mean to. She's crying at the party. She's throwing up like, and we're just like, wait, <laughs> my God, you're, you want this engagement, you're not getting it home. So you're trying to get it everywhere else. And she's not getting it at home. And she won't see that. Because if we say something to her like, you are in a very bad relationship. 
and it is only going to get worse. And we mean catastrophic, okay? If she looks right at that, now the onus is on her to change it, to move out, to maybe not have kids ever because the, the, the clock is ticking, you know, to change her job. Her whole world, it just implodes, right? I guess an implosion's it, sorry. That's an explosion, implosion. And she won't do it. Because if, if she looks that in the face, she is compelled to act. And acting costs too much. One of my other friends is becoming a therapist. And we were talking about, I, I was asking her kind of about people like this. Like when you just are like, can you look at the writing on the wall? I ha! Ah, you just want to like make them see. And it's fucking maddening when they won't. And she's like, change has a cost. All change. Positive change has a cost. Think about there's a cost to drinking more water every day. That has a cost. You got to slip around the thing. You got to pee all the time, right? You don't get to have your favorite Diet Coke. You're not supposed to have that. And that's how you spent your lunch break. You have your Diet Coke and you sit in the sun. You're like, uh. no, you have to drink fucking water now. And that's not a treat. It's just something you have to do. That has a cost. You think facing the music that your husband is cheating and you're having a baby with a surrogate, right? Like, I guess Tristan isn't her husband. You know what I mean? That doesn't have a cost all has a cost. But here's what the brave do. Here's what a psychological badasses do. We calculate the cost and we understand that negative behavior and denial has a cost as well. Do we need more proof than Khloe Kardashian? I really, until this episode, I don't think I was aware of how much of a denial monster she is. And because her family kept saying it, it's like she buries her head in the sand, she's in denial, blah, 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 blah. And in this situation, like it culminated into her not really seeming like she wanted this baby. You know, I hate to say that and I hate to put that out there because she's a great mom and I'm sure she's on board with it now, but it was interesting how the rhetoric changed. Like this whole previous time when she was still with Tristan and like lying about it, right? And she would never speak ill of him because it was for true. Oh, because of true, we're protecting true and all this stuff and you know, blah, blah, blah. I never heard that once about the new baby. I, I'm trying to protect, you know, the peace of the new baby. I'm trying, it was, I'm trying to protect myself and I'm trying to protect the surrogate. It was a subtle rhetorical shift, but it was there. And to me, it's because she was divorced from the idea that this baby was about to be hers. And you understand it. And, you know, Kim even talked about it. It's like, it's a surrogate and you, you, you're not here. You're not pregnant. You're not feeling it. You're not seeing them all the time. The way you connect to that experience is with your partner and getting excited and having those conversations in the nursery. And what are we going to name him? And she's like, there's no partner either. So it's like this thing's going to arrive on our doorstep like a fucking Amazon package. Like, okay. But with this huge negative association, that's not the fault of the child. And you know, that burns off. It, I mean, I hope so. I hope so. I don't think we will ever see if it doesn't. Stranger things have happened than kids coming into this world who aren't wanted. And it is not actually, unfortunately, all that rare that the parents let them know, tacitly or overtly. I would prefer it if you weren't here. Again, I don't think that's going to be Chloe. She's a great mom. The whole family loves kids. But that's something a lot of people have felt. I mean, that was the only real message I had from my father. He never, he never said it, but you, he showed it through actions, which were zero actions. No answer is an answer. Absence is a sort of presence, isn't it? And that is not something that goes unnoticed. You know, you play the card you're dealt, as a child, as a, as a person in a family, you know, as a human. We would all love a different circumstance if that was our circumstance, but it, it isn't. So we, the, the shift in Chloe is, to me, very pronounced, very, very sad, but hopefully very temporary. I don't know, though. I mean, I felt bad for her when she was talking with Chris and they were in that condo that Chris forgot she owned. I don't know why they decided they needed to film there, but okay. 
And Chris was like, I want you to be happy and I want you to enjoy this and you're never going to get this time back. And it's like, I felt like she was gaslighting Chloe because for so long, you know, Chloe's been in denial. Chris had said that, like she's in denial. It's like, well, now she's actually feeling shit. She's feeling what she is naturally supposed to feel, realizing you're basically having a baby with a nightmare person and maybe you don't, maybe you regret this situation and you don't really want to be having this baby. Let's just be blunt. If, if there was a time machine... Maybe she would get in it. Let her feel that. Let her feel that. Which brings us to our lesson about regret. Now we gotta, we gotta back up to where we were. Curious, not furious, right? I want you to do as, as much as you possibly can to pull back and look at the forest for the trees, as they say. Look at the landscape of your life and try to see connections. This is where therapists come in very, very handy. Like we talked the other day about how to make therapy work. Therapists, they look at, it's like they look at a night sky full of stars and they're like, and they connect random dots into constellations. They turn a smattering of nonsense and chaos into a picture. Oh, so because your mom traveled for work and you couldn't talk to her when she was gone and it was a feast or famine sort of attention situation, you date guys who do that. You have wonderful, incredible dates, and then you don't hear from it for four days. And then wonderful, incredible dates, and then they're gone. And you also do that to people. You're a serial obsessor. You love, 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 love. I'm tired of it. I love, 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 love this song, this outfit, this food, this person. And then I'm tired of it. Oh. Okay. That's a constellation. Okay. Okay. Is that icky and embarrassing to feel? Of course. It's like humiliating. To, it's it's in a way humiliating to acknowledge that that we even have issues. But why? Everyone does. We can acknowledge our dogs have issues. Oh, he doesn't like garbage trucks. Oh no, don't get noodles around a garbage truck. Doesn't like them. Ooh, he doesn't like eyes and overalls. You can understand why. It's pretty stupid, right? We can understand that animals have trauma and association and things that they don't like and things that fuck them up from when they're young, and it doesn't take much. It is one bad experience with a man dressed like Super Mario Brothers, and he will not fuck with any dude in overalls, as none of us should. So we gotta take this, like, the furious out of acknowledging, like, okay, there's, there's connections in my life. <sighs> there's connections. And we gotta shift into the curious. Okay. If there's one connection here, where else are there connections in my life? Like I just said, in my own example, it's not just that I date people or I have these relationships that are like so intense, so intense, so intense, and then like ghost, and so intense, so intense, and ghost. It's not a coincidence that that relates to, I love this song, I love this song, repeat, repeat, repeat. And then I'm like, oh. grilled cheese, grilled cheese, grilled cheese. Huh. Because look, when we can see those parallels in the small area, the song on repeat, the grilled cheese. What if, instead of trying to fix this huge thing in our life, like how I relate to men and how I relate to my family and how I communicate, ah, that seems like this abyss you're gonna fall into and never come out of. It just seems overwhelming to try to dismantle it. Okay, how about instead, we focus on the grilled cheese. We focus on that Jack Harlow song I have literally on repeat eight times in a row. Well, well, why do I need to though? Like, can I just eat grilled cheese for six days straight and listen to nothing but first class? Can I just do that? Yes. But what I'm doing while I do that is normalizing a set of behaviors and patterns and more importantly, a feeling, a vibration that I extend into other areas of my life that actually do have major consequences. You don't think that the first class and the grilled cheese is gonna lead to a fucked up marriage? But it can, it can. Not that one will necessarily create the other, but again, it's creating this normalcy around a pattern of behavior that actually is not beneficial to you in any other category outside of Jack Harlow and grilled cheese. Think about it with exercise. Oh, I'm gonna sign up for CrossFit, I'm gonna do it hardcore for a month, and then never do it again, right? I am a serial obsessor, and I'm just using this as an example because it's my own. Yours might be completely different. There might be a few, but let's just, I'm sure there's probably, sorry, I don't want to say it's like, oh, there's a few, fucking great. 
Let's, there's one. Okay, there's just one. I'm so sorry. Let's just focus on one. You know, it's it's all we that's all we can can deal with right now. But what if when we're like, and again, Spotify, play first class by just don't. Okay. Let's pivot to something else. Let's just try it. Let's not chase that dragon. Let's start to arrest those patterns on the small scale and just see, curious, not furious. Let's just see if I'm plugging into a different, more moderate vibration. Because I think when we get into situations that we regret or when we look back in the past, we're like, why couldn't I have just let him in? Why couldn't I have just locked him out? Whatever it might be. They, I think it's because we're coming from a place of extremity. You know, I couldn't let him in because I couldn't, I couldn't risk getting hurt. I couldn't lock him out because I couldn't risk being alone because I cannot be alone with myself and my thoughts. I can't fucking do it. Those are extreme thought patterns. The middle path is the path of happiness. It's fucking difficult. I'm going to have two drinks, not nine. I'm going to have three chips with queso, not 45. It's tough. It's tough. It's emotional budgeting. Who the hell wants to set a budget? It sucks. But do you want the outcome of what a budget will yield? Yes. You want peace, stability, predictability. Don't you? If you're on this video, yes, you do. And we have to stop equating those things, peace, stability, predictability, as bad, boring, oh, there's no chemistry. No. No. We need to start normalizing a life of sanity and dignity. Don't we? Chloe stayed in that situation with Tristan because she was getting some emotional payout from it. What that was, who knows? Someone treating her as badly as she feels about herself? A project to work on that isn't herself because that seems too difficult? Ooh, I've been there. A lot of us have been there. So if we can shift out of these places of extremity, we can avoid these things happening in the future. But like I said, the point of this video is to talk about regret. Like, well, this is great going forward. How do I let go? How do, how do I let go? How do I say to myself, oh yeah, no, um, leaving my actually wonderful husband. No, that was a fucking great idea. Cause I, who's my boyfriend now? Oh, would that be no one? Got it. And I'm in the trenches of Tinder. Love it. Love it. It's a great idea. And you know what? These bullshit live, laugh, love, home goods, wooden sign phrases, everything happens for a reason. Trust the path. Trust the process. That's real easy when you're not on it. It is. And I say that to you guys. You've got to trust. You've got to have faith. And if you're religious, that's easier to tap into. You're used to having faith. Oh, this dude walked on water. You know, water into wine, whatever. Okay. If you're not particularly religious, if you're very analytical, this is hard. And I actually talked, I did an Instagram live with Laura, my mindset coach. And this is one thing we talked about, like, how do you plug into something that feels impossible? And she talked a lot about regret and unblocking yourself. And that's, that's initially how I found her is I couldn't get over something in my life. I couldn't. Every bad experience in my life, like a shitty cashier at a grocery store, it took me right back to this place of betrayal from someone. And I couldn't. It was just this, this roadblock that whichever way I looked, I couldn't get through. I didn't know what to do. And she really gave me some good tools to like get over it. So if, if that's something you're dealing with, she's very, very helpful. Truly, when I look at the bad, the bad, regretful things in my life, had they not happened, I wouldn't be where I am. And I mean like literally where I am, like in Montana. If I'd stayed married, do you think I'd live in Montana? <laughs> that's a pretty tough sell to get like a New York hedge funder out to Montana. You know, I don't even know if I would be a YouTuber if I had stayed married. I probably wouldn't have needed to work after some point. And I don't know that I would have like had it in me. You don't, you don't know. It's this butterfly effect. And so what you're focusing on right now is all the things that that, that regretful thing, that incident, that splinter, that wound, all the bad things it's created. But look, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, right? That's Newton's law. There's two sides to every coin. If it created bad things, I guarantee you it created good things. That is literally how anything works. 
It's balance. It, there's constant, I won't say harmony, but there's equal and opposite. Now you might be saying, really? I would love to know what good things my DUI created. I would love to fucking know as I'm paying $10,000, as I spent two nights in jail, as I have to take the bus everywhere. What exactly good did this create? That is not my job to answer. Unfortunately, that's yours. Ugh. I know. I know. This is where the shitty work comes in. This is where being that intellectual elite like we are and looking at things and getting that self-awareness and seeing the constellations in the forest for the trees, this is when people dip out. It's all fun and games until I have to try to find something good in something awful. Fuck you, Shallon. I know. I know. I know. Oh, there's something good in my mom dying? There's something good in me getting cancer, getting an accident? I know. I know. The good might not equal to the bad. That's, that's honestly pretty rare. What was the good that came out of September 11th? I'm just... What would that be exactly, you know? Sometimes the good, it almost needs a different name. Because sometimes the good is, I slowed down. I was able to cultivate gratitude for what I had before this. And now when I move forward in my life, I pause a little bit more and I try to be more grateful for the things that I have and that are going on now, you know? Maybe that's... Maybe that's it. Maybe that good is short. Maybe it's finite. And maybe it feels like a drop in the ocean compared to the bad. Okay? Okay. As long as you can just kind of like open that little peephole to the good and just give your mind the option to see something good out of something bad. And look, if it is something like a death or a loss or, you know, you feel selfish, like, oh, Oh, I'm supposed to, to try to find why it's good that my grandmother died? Like, that's disgusting. I, I know. Not like, oh, yay, I'm so glad this happened. There's a difference between I am looking for the, the upsides of this experience, how it broke my heart open and how I can feel more, how I'm more empathetic to other people and what they're going through versus I am so glad this happened. I'm never going to be glad September 11th happened. I don't think I'm ever going to be glad my grandmother died or that I had an abortion or that I got divorced. Like, I don't know that I'm ever going to be like, yeah, woo, woo. I'm never going to have that feeling about it. And you don't have to. There's a huge difference. Remember the middle path. There's, we're not in, this is the worst thing. I, this is the most catastrophic thing in the entire world. And woo. We, we are not in either one of these places. We're here. Maybe we're even just here. This is mostly catastrophic, but I'm going to tap into like some, some thing, some beneficiality to me, to the world. And even, like I said, even if that's just, now I have empathy for people, you know, I, I feel it when someone says on Instagram, their grandparent died, like, oh. I pause and I send them a little bit of a prayer. I send them a note. And you know, before this happened to me, I, I would have been like, oh, that's sad, but I would have kept scrolling, you know? That doesn't feel like a huge win. That's not a woo. That's not a woo. But we're not extreme people. We are strong enough and we are high level thinkers enough to try to find that middle path. Not even the middle, just may, maybe, maybe a little outside of the dark, icky, black tar of it all. We're right maybe just a little over here. Okay. But sometimes, sometimes fuck all that shit, right? Sometimes fuck all that shit. Sometimes bad things just happen and you just wish they hadn't. We've done a video before on how to get over losing the one, like the love of your life, someone who you saw a huge future with, someone who you connected with. If you guys are in the Chalantourage, you've heard me talk about the ferret, this guy who, I mean, Laura helped me manifest him. I mean, I did this whole manifestation thing with her about unblocking myself from love. And I'm like, I'm really, I really truly am ready to meet somebody to integrate into my life, like really. And 
I didn't even know that priorly I wasn't. Like I was very closed off. Two days later, I met him too. And I was like, oh my God. This, everything, everything clicked into place. Everything clicked into place. From my divorce, even like getting, try, people trying to cancel me and moving to Montana. I was like, it all led me here. Until it didn't. Until it didn't. And I don't know. I don't think our path is done. You know, maybe that sounds stupid. I'm sure it does. When, do, when does it not? <laughs> when, when does hope not feel silly? But sometimes faith, it's like Baroxa, the audacity of hope. And so I had done this video like months before, you know, th this ferret. That's because that's what my phone autocorrects his name to. That's why we call him the ferret. He doesn't look like one. <laughs> He's small and long. <laughs> but I had done this video on how to get over like the one. Like when you think you've met the love of your life and it doesn't happen. Like how, what do you, the fuck do you do with that? And my radical advice was lean into it. Lean in. Instead of telling yourself like, no, something better is coming. Say the opposite. Be like, I will love this person forever. Because when I was like 25, I thought I had met the love of my life. He's in an emo band. He's a fucking nightmare of a person. And that didn't work out. And I tried everything to get over him. And finally, I was just, I was so exhausted. I gave up. I was like, I'm just going to love him forever. I am. <laughs> Everyone is going to be compared to him forever. Not according to height, though, because he's an inch shorter than me and had to cheat with everybody. That's fine. Doesn't matter. But when I just sort of like surrendered to that feeling, it's like the knots instantly loosen because I was dealing with all of this cognitive dissonance. What I want versus the reality, not the same. And I was in this constant state of emotional stress and tension because what I wanted wasn't happening. What I wanted wasn't happening. And your mind's like, ah, it's just on fire all the time trying to process this and make sense of it. And, and when I was finally like, what I want isn't happening, okay? And I'm just, I'm, I will maybe find love, but it's always just going to be a little bit worse than what I had with him. I swear to God, I don't even know why it works, but it did. The knots loosened and I was like, oh, oh. do I really think that? Do I really think I'm never going to? No, I don't think that. It's like I was pushing against that idea so hard that when I just stopped, it kind of collapsed in on itself. Like it, the logic didn't support it. So that's what I've been trying to do with the ferret. Like a few weeks ago, I was like, I'm just gonna love this person forever. Like I am never going to meet someone who checks the boxes, who makes me feel this way, who I see a future with, who... <sighs> just never. And it's, it really has helped. It has loosened. Is it gone? No. I, clearly, I'm still twisted about it to a degree. But it has helped. Because if nothing else, you're now managing expectations. I'm like, okay, I don't know that I'm going to meet someone who makes me feel this way. But what if I could meet someone who makes me feel 70% of this way? Okay. Okay. Maybe... You dial things down a little bit. Are you settling? I don't know. Fucking maybe. But is it worse to settle, settle, than to stay in this place of agony and regret and comparison forever and reject anyone who comes along? You're not the ferret. You're not the ferret. You're not the ferret. You're not the ferret. You don't make me feel this way. But it's like, hold on, hold on, hold on. I acknowledge none of y'all motherfuckers are going to make me feel this way. But maybe you can make me feel 60% this way. Oh my God, maybe you'll hit 85 that's not a hundred, but it's better than zero. And staying in this place of nobody's good enough is a zero. That's a zero. That's what I get from that. It's worse than zero because zero is peace. Zero is nothing. And constantly comparing everyone to this person and staying in this place of regret is taking things from me. It's not a zero. It's a minus 70. It's a minus 10,000. I am emptier. I'm not even whole and bored. I am empty. Hmm. So if we can simultaneously look at the thing that we regret, dropping out of school, getting that DUI, and listen, I'm not going to lump in like a tragedy, like a death occurring because that's, that's a sad, horrible thing, but it, 
you shouldn't place regret on it because you didn't do it. I mean, I don't think we're all killers here. I mean, <laughs> don't come to my house looking for trouble. But if you can take this thing that you regret, unpack why you feel like you had a hand in this, and you probably did, maybe you did, right? Like, how did you, curious, not furious, how did you play a part in this? How does that link to other things going on in your life? And how can you stop doing the tiniest links on that chain, just the tiniest little parts, the grilled cheese, the Jack Harlow? How can you stop doing those things while also acknowledging, okay, I am just going to regret leaving my husband. I'm going to regret how much I drank sophomore year. I'm never going to look at that and be like, yay, woo! I'm not looking for a place of woo. I'm not trying to get to the woo. But I'm also trying to get out of the abyss. Where am I trying to get? Like right, right here, ideally, but also maybe just right here. Just maybe right here. I regret drinking so much sophomore year, but hey, a lot of people, they don't regret drinking until they're like 38. I, I'm watching it in real time. Trust me on this. So yeah, that DUI was horrible, but I'm almost glad it's like out of the way and I've learned that lesson now so that I don't have to waste 10 more years not knowing this lesson, okay? Hey, I regret getting divorced. I regret how that relationship went, but I did learn a lot about myself and I learned a lot about what is and is not important to me. I learned a lot about my needs in a relationship, how to and not communicate. Was that kind of a rough crash course in those things? Yeah. Do I wish I'd gotten those lessons in a different format? Like a PDF or something instead of a fucking divorce? Yes, I do. But I still got them. And we don't always get to choose the format of lessons. Or we do. Okay, we do. How am I going to move forward in my life choosing that PDF format, choosing an, a tidy downloadable with cute infographics to learn emotional lessons about myself instead of divorces and breakups? How can I take a better, easier path? Maybe it relates to the Jack Harlow. Maybe it relates to the grilled cheese. Maybe... If I get used to taking a more middle path in other categories of my life that don't seem to matter, that don't seem to matter, maybe that I'll connect to that vibration and I won't feel so called to extremities in other areas, extremities that led me to the things that I now regret. It won't tap into what I literally just find familiar. No, I'm not going to max out a credit card on that girl's trip. I don't, that's just not me. Because look, when I'm living in a place of extremity, when I have been, it's off to the races. It's off to the races. Like, what's the difference? Why wouldn't I max out the credit card? I fucked four guys last week. I mean, I haven't. But you know what I'm talking about. It's like, you have this story now. Remember pain and suffering and stories and not stories? Mm -hmm. You have applied this story to yourself that, well, this is just how I am. This is just how I am. Of course, I'm going to sleep with him the first night I meet him. <laughs> Look at what I bought on Shein. Look at all that bullshit I bought on Shein. You're not linking these two concepts in your conscious mind. You're not going to say these things to yourself. You're saying it in an internal vibrational setting. You're saying it in a way that is so automatic. Because what you've connected to, kind of, is shame. And a lack of accountability. And a... <sighs> of course... A lack of being in the driver's seat, I guess, in your own life. Well, of course, I'm going to make that decision. What? Well, am I going to make a different decision? Yeah, okay, because I make different decisions all the time. <laughs> Let's look at denial. What? Where else do you practice denial in your life? Avoidance. Maybe not denial, but like avoidance. You know what I avoid is opening my mail. I talked about this. I don't know what is with me. I don't know what is with me. I hate it. Oh God. I, I don't know. But I, I know that I feel like it. I can't even talk about it. I can't even talk about the mail. I hate it. I hate it. I don't know why I have the money to pay anything that comes in. What is wrong with me? What's with me? I don't know. I, I don't know. But it's connected to something. And instead, see the shame with which I was going like this? I was That was a shame response I just now had because I was getting furious and not curious. 
I feel like I can't even look right at this. I can't even look right at this because I'm so ashamed about it. It's so fucking stupid. It's so embarrassing. And it's so confusing to me. Well, no shit you're not going to solve it if, you, if that's how you feel about a problem. How on earth could you solve a problem that you have applied that story to? Do you see how these things all tie together? How could you ever solve a problem when that's the, when that's the story? But if you can pull back, be a little analytical, and look, engage other people in your life. I say this all the time. Your friends are sitting there, the historian. If my friend who was wiling out at my party would come to me and say, I feel like things are off with me. I'd be like, oh, can I pull up my notes app? Because I have some things to say. Like, I've dismantled exactly what's going on in her life. I know exactly what to say to her. I know exactly what to do. She's not asking because she doesn't want to know. But when you are truly ready to know, and like I said, if you're on this video, I think that you are. I think that you are. Engage someone. It doesn't have to be the entire squad, and which can compound the embarrassment. Someone who loves you, your like nerdy friend, you know, who's going to, to shoot you straight in a gentle way and say it. Be like, I need you to shoot me straight, but in a very gentle way because I have a lot of humiliation around this issue. I just feel so fucking embarrassed. Okay? I guarantee you, why am I going to cry again? This period. She is going to say, you don't need to feel embarrassed. Why? Don't feel embarrassed that you stayed with a fuckboy too long. It happens to all of us. I've got a hair right in my face. Don't feel embarrassed you can't open your mail. Let's just get to the root of it. Like, let's just figure this out without the story. We are the ones applying the story. Other people are not always the ones applying the story. Which is why I feel bad for Chloe because other people are. You know, people are just shitting on her left and right. And it's like this woman is suffering for God's sakes. Like, is she making the best choices? Of course not. And the reason we've talked about her and gotten so gassed up is because she reminds us of us. You know, like I said in the beginning, I, have we not all experienced this self-loathing, chasing the guy, fixing someone so you don't have to fix yourself, like hoping things are going to be different? Hello? We've all been there. We get it. We get it. We get it. And we get gassed up because we want her to do better. Because she's all of us. She's trying to fix Tristan instead of fixing herself. We're trying to fix Chloe instead of fixing ourselves. If I can just fix Chloe, everything in my life will be okay. <laughs> I'm going to go take another Midol. You know, your period, it's like you've laid a million eggs and they're all hatching at once, to quote New Girl. It's exactly what it feels like. Okay, Shalligators, I'm going to be back next time. We're going to keep on rolling through our breakdown of Love is Blind and the other couples. And like I said, tell me your Evil Week ideas down here in the comments section. And also, I talked about her, my manifestation coach. If, if this is like sounding like something that could be up your alley, you know, definitely join me. The link's down there in the bio. Ditto with our Mexico trip. And of course, a link to the Chalantourage. If you want some extra bonus videos and hear me talk in a bit more detail, <sighs> weepy detail. I cry constantly in my story time videos to you guys in the Chalantourage. <laughs> um, go ahead and click the link down below and save 25%. I'll see you later, Shalligators.